Good morning, everyone. Speaking from Maryland, I just want to say to begin with that we are uh, delighted and honored to be here among you. Uh, it's our pleasure, and as the uh, pastor said earlier, we would love to get to meet you uh, during our time in Stavanger. So as you have time, opportunity, and desire, we would love to get together for coffee or a walk. Um, We've been walking around a lot, trying to uh, find our way around a little bit and get a little bit acclimated to, to where we are. Uh, yesterday we walked from uh, your house up to the top of the high hill and uh, overlooked the, the city. And uh, so we've been trying to find our way around a little bit, walking around the city. Um, we are, we're really flexible, uh, especially this week. We're going to be around all week. We have lots of time. And uh, maybe, as Pastor said, we hope to see a little more of this beautiful country uh, while we're here, but uh, this week we're going to be in Stavanger for the entire week. I, I don't suppose it would come as any surprise to you if I said we're living in some powerful times. Uh, we are living in turbulent times. We're living even in perilous times. And... Uh, in a book first published in 2005 entitled Powerful Times, Eamon Kelly uh, used the, an example, a story of back in ancient Europe where the Council of uh, Florence sent Niccolo Machiavelli. There's a name that became known uh, throughout the world for intrigue. But they sent him to Siena to meet with Pandolfo Petrucci, the Lord of Siena to try to figure out what made for the success of his government. Machiavelli was impressed with what he heard when he asked the question about why he was so successful, and he said, wishing to make as few mistakes as possible, I order my government from day to day and my affairs from hour to hour because the times are more powerful than our brains. Now, if that was true 500 years ago, how much more so today? We have been living for the last several years with a stubborn pandemic that has taken the lives of millions of people worldwide and still is with us, even though we've returned to a semblance of normalcy. There is war again raging in Europe that's costing tens of thousands of lives and awful destruction and devastation. There's political instability. There's the fears of the markets worldwide tumbling right now. People are polarized in different camps politically and socially according to their views. Shortages and inflation, which we can all relate to, challenge us daily. And yet, the writer of the Old Testament book, Ecclesiastes, said there's really nothing new under the sun. In the early days of the pandemic, as I would watch the news, uh, the reporters would come on the TV and uh, would almost trip over themselves seeing how many times they could use the word unprecedented. It was unprecedented what we were experiencing. It was historic what we were exper experiencing. So I did a little historical research myself and went back over time. There's nothing new under the sun. There's plenty of precedent for everything that we're experiencing today. It's just that we're the ones experiencing it right now. We used to read about it in history, but now it's us that are experiencing this, these very things. People of God we have always lived in perilous times. We have always lived in times when there are forces that are hostile to the gospel that threaten the very existence of the church. And that has been true ever since the ascension of Jesus and the, and the birth of the church. Sometimes we say the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Yes and no. 
Sometimes the church has grown during times of persecution and perilous and powerful times like we're experiencing, but at other times the church has become dangerously close to extinction. We served in Japan for a few years, and during the Tokugawa shogunate, the persecution of the church very nearly eliminated all vestiges of Christian faith in Japan. So what do you say to a church whose existence is tenuous at best, where at any moment the doors of her meeting place could be broken down, the members dragged off to prison or worse, and that where there was no guarantee of their future? What can give confidence in perilous, powerful times? Cheer up, things are going to get better. They didn't know that in the early church. In fact, as we consider this book of Revelation, things weren't really going to get any better for over 200 years. When Constantine converted to Christian faith and Christianity became a protected religion in the empire, I don't know what's going to happen in this world. I have no idea what the stock market's going to be. I have no idea the outcome of the conflicts that are taking place. I don't know the, what's going to happen regarding COVID. Well, to such a church, under duress, with a threat of extermination, the risen Christ sent a letter. And he sent it by the hand of an aged apostle, probably by this time the last one. Everybody else had died an unnatural death. But this aged apostle was also having his own struggles. He was spending his retirement years on the island of Patmos, which was not a resort community at that time. It was a place where the Romans sent their prisoners to exile just to try to get them out of the way. And the apostle that was self-described in his gospel as the disciple Jesus loved was on the island of Patmos, which is a small island in the Aegean Sea off the coast of Turkey, present-day Turkey. And he's spending his golden years banished by the Romans, who probably figured if we can just get him out of contact with these churches, these troublesome Christians, this last apostle, if we can just get rid of him, silence him, the church will be no problem to us. This book of Revelation that we're just going to consider part of in four weeks, obviously we're not going to get through much. This book was probably written during the reign of Emperor Domitian who at that time, at, during his reign, the cult of emperor worship was at its height. And one of the reasons the church was in big trouble was all you had to do to be in the good graces of the Roman government at the time was to come before the altar to Caesar, sprinkle some incense, and simply say these words, Caesar is Lord. The only trouble is the church couldn't say that because the church knew that for us, there's only one Lord, and that wasn't Caesar. It wasn't the emperor. It wasn't Domitian. But this aged apostle is given a letter by the risen Lord of the church to bring to the church hope. Not optimism, and I'll explain the difference in another message. You can hold me to that. He gave them a message of hope, not optimism, to help them understand that there is an alternate reality to the reality that they were experiencing. There was something that was unseen behind all that they were seeing and feeling and experiencing. It was a message to inspire faithful perseverance, not to encourage fanciful speculation about end times or about when Christ might return. And I suppose I should just stop here for a second and say that's always been a problem in the church. 
starting from the very day when Jesus left his disciples, when they asked him, Lord, is it this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know. Not for you to know. But that hasn't stopped us down through the centuries from trying to set dates and make predictions. There's been literally scores of specific predictions about when Jesus might return. One of the most famous in the religious history of my country, the U.S., is what, what became, for obvious reasons, known as the Great Disappointment. On October 22, 1844, literally tens of thousands of believers gathered in their ch churches. Some of them donned white robe that they called ascension robes and went up into the hills, mostly in the eastern part of the United States. And on, they expected Jesus to return on October 22, 1844. On October 23rd, they had to return to a reality that they thought they would never have to deal with again. Christ hadn't come. Our own experience tells us the same thing. After our first short-term mission ministry in Japan, in Tokyo, we returned to take the pastorate in, uh, in the U.S. for a little while. And uh, one day in my mailbox came a little booklet entitled, this was 1987, mind you. Pastor David, I really wish I could become younger like the, the pictures of Aaron and his family. This was 1987. I'm in my study. The mail comes, and it unsolicited comes this little booklet entitled, with the fascinating title, 88 Reasons Why the Lord Must Return in 1988. <laughs> you can probably get a real deal on a whole warehouse full of those books somewhere by now. But here we are. 34 years later in this place, and we still wait. The revelation to the church as personified by the seven churches in modern-day Turkey, then known as Asia Minor, pulls back the curtain to show the church that despite evidence to the contrary, their universe is not out of control. It is firmly under the control of one who is fulfilling his story and in whose story they and we are safely held. Now, I, this is small print on the screen. My fault. That's my bad. I, I broke a fundamental rule of PowerPoint here, so uh, forgive me. But if you have your Bible, would you turn to Revelation chapter 4? And as you're doing that, let me pray for this message. Holy Father, I ask you that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. For we want to see Jesus, because it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Feel free to follow along as I read Revelation chapter 4. I would invite you to feel free to read chapters 1 through 3 sometime this week during your devotions. But uh, since we have to make choices about what to cover, this is where I'm going to start. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. 
From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, The twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created." a throne. Immediately, Jesus, through the Apostle John, takes the church behind the scenes and shows them a throne. But he does more than that. He shows them a throne that is occupied. Now, these, the, the church was used to a throne. The emperor had his throne. Caesar sat upon a throne. In fact, Caesar sat upon a throne and demanded to be worshipped as God. They were used to one on the throne, but John takes them behind the scenes to tell this people who knew very well about the throne in Rome where there sat one who was a pretender. There was a throne that was occupied, one who deserved to be there. God himself. John will stress that this isn't the real throne, the Roman throne. This isn't the place where ultimate glory and power dwelt, even though their lives, and here's a point we need to understand as believers, our lives are impacted by what rulers do and by what rulers say and the edicts that they make and the laws that they pass, just as these believers were having their lives impacted by what Caesar decreed. He's not saying our lives would not be impacted by living in this world, but what he is saying that our ultimate destiny, our ultimate lives, our ultimate being isn't dictated to us by any capital in this world. It belongs to to one who sits on the throne. His first words to the church here, I saw a throne and one seated on it. Their ultimate destinies and lives did not belong to Caesar, but to this one who sits on the throne. And then he goes on to try to describe it. And as I've read this passage, thinking about it and praying over it, I began to think to myself, How do you describe the indescribable? How do you see the one whom no one can see and live? So so this vision that's given to, to the Apostle John is one in which we start piling on superlatives after superlatives to see that this is a throne of awesome glory and might and power and judgment and wisdom, and everything else in between. There are not enough terms to describe the glory of God. There are not enough precious things in this world to tell about the glory of God. 
But so John does the best he come, that he can. And this is a reminiscent of Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. I'll just read those. You can follow along as I do. Isaiah chapter 5, or chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, where the prophet receives his commission. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. This is a scene in Revelation 4 that harkens back to Isaiah chapter 6 of the place where God dwells is that place of unimaginable glory and wisdom and holiness and honor. The one seated on the throne is the center of unceasing worship on the part of this new redeemed humanity as represented by what are called elders, and 24 of them would seem to imply that we have seated securely around the throne a redeemed people of God from both Old Testament and New Testament age, from one church being brought together comprised of Jews and Gentiles. But there's more. There's the four living creatures. There's the cherubim or seraphim from Isaiah chapter 6. They're there too, praising God, praising the one who deserves what Caesar demands, but only one who deserves it. And that's the setting. And we need to just keep that in our minds because everything else that happens afterward in this book comes as a result of this vision of the glory of God in Revelation 4 and then of the redemptive glory of God in Revelation 5. Every, every, this is the center of attention. The curtain is pulled back. And this is where everything happens. This is where everything comes from. This is where the control lies. Everything else may be falling apart around them, but this is where their lives and their destinies are secured as our ours. So we need to go on, though. Again, I apologize for my violation of PowerPoint protocol in putting too much text on the screen, but Revelation chapter 5. We have this vision of the glory of God in chapter 4. That takes center stage. Along the, with this on center stage is chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand... See, we don't get this detail in chapter 4, but now we get it in chapter 5. I saw in the right hand of him who sits on the th throne a scroll. Okay, we're good. Sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look in it. And I began to weep loudly because there was no one found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, 
the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to open the scroll or to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And that's another way of saying millions and billions. Uh, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and in earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped i saw a scroll in the hand right hand of the one who sits on the throne Unlike the scroll in the picture, which only has one seal, this one had seven. Why seven? Well, usually seven indicates a number of completion in Scripture. This thing is shut. This thing is sealed. This thing is not open to anyone. In the old days, in the days of scrolls, you, they would be sealed with, with a hot wax, and usually then with the signet or the ring of the ruler or authority who was sending the scroll, and it better not be opened by anyone except to whom the scroll was sent. It had better not be opened by anyone except the person who had the right to receive it and look at it. This scroll we read of in chapter 5 that is in the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. Where is it? It's in God's hands. What is it? Well, there's been some speculation. I just like to think of it as the book of everything. History, the past, the present, the future, meaning, significance, life, death, destiny, it's all here. I, I just think of it as the book of everything, God's plan for his creation, God working out his plan for his creation to bring us back to himself. Uh, if you just think with me of that as the book of everything, that's easy enough. And it is securely in God's hands. But there's nobody who can look at it. And John, receiving this vision, begins to weep at the lack of anyone found worthy to even look at the scroll or into the scroll. And he begins to weep and weep. Some of the old, other versions said, and I wept and I wept because no one was found worthy. And friends, why not weep? If it's all a mystery, if it's all unavailable, why not weep? Is there no one who can chart our destiny for us? Is history just a meaningless cycle of events and happenings that take place? And then we fail to learn from those, so we do them all over again. 
and it just keeps going and going indefinitely? Is this it? Is there no mean? Can nobody explain the meaning to us of life? Can nobody show us where we're going? If there is no meaning, if there is no purpose, then why not weep? Because despair is really pretty logical if that's all there is to this life and to what we're living now. But then one of the elders, one of those representing the redeemed of all time and in all place, comes and he tells them that there's hope. Now, others have tried to wrest this scroll from the hand of him who sits on the throne. Rome had been around for about 500 years at this point. Caesar demanded to be worshipped as God. Dictators, tyrants, empires, they've all tried to wrest this, this scroll from the hand of God. Even, in our, even closer to our own day, if we think of the Third Reich. It was going to last for a thousand years. It lasted for 12. Nations rise and fall. Kingdoms are are planted and plucked up. Things come and go. Everybody who's tried to say, we are the ones in control of history and destiny, they've all come and gone. So everybody tries, but they've all met the same fate. But here there's hope. Yeah, let's, okay, there we go. John turns and he sees. <laughs> now you would have thought when the elder had told John that, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered, John would have turned and seen what? A lion, right? Doesn't see a lion. He sees a lamb. Jesus is introduced to the church in so many different ways and with so many pictures throughout this book. He, he's introduced as the one with the flaming head of fire who walks among the lampstands, the church. He's introduced as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's introduced now as the lamb. Later, he'll, and sooner than you think, he'll be introduced as the rider on the white horse. He, he, he's shown to his church in a variety of ways, but here he is shown as the way in which he conquers is not through warfare, not through weapons, not through political power. How has the Lamb conquered? By being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Are, is the church experiencing a cross as they live in Rome, in the Roman world? So did Jesus. And this is how he conquered. God set him forth as the kingdom ruler on a cross. The lamb is the conquering lion, not by wielding temporal power as does Caesar, but by the cross, which is what qualifies him to take this scroll and begin to reign. It's what qualifies him to open up our destiny, our future, give meaning to our past and our present. In his ascension, which we just celebrated as at the end of the festal season that we began in Advent on the church calendar, Jesus is brought to the right hand of the Father, amazingly enough, and he begins to reign. He takes the scroll, and he begins to open the seals. He's already at the right hand of the Father, and he merely takes it from the Father. He doesn't go up and wrest it from his hand and fight him for it. The Father freely gives it to him because he conquered at the cross as the Lamb of God. And in response to this, all heaven breaks out 
in unrestrained and uninhibited praise and worship of this one who, because he poured out his soul unto death, has done what no one else could do. And he receives an ever-increasing crescendo of praise, starting with the elders and the four living creatures and then billions of angels and then ultimately every creature in heaven and on earth. We'll go another one. We'll go another one. There we go. Here's the end of the matter. This is where we're heading, folks. This is what gives us hope. There is hope. And what we see in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 leads us to this point that Paul had talked about when he wrote to the Philippians and said, there's coming a day when at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The stage is set. The vision has been given. The curtain has been pulled aside so that the church can see, ah, there's something going on here other than what we see in our daily lives and in the world that is hostile to us. This is going to be for a beleaguered church somewhat of an aha moment. Their setting is hostile. Their world seems to be out of control. Their lives are hunted. Their future is bleak. They're a hated minority thought to be treasonous because they will not offer the incense to Caesar and confess that Caesar is Lord. Their very existence, individually and corporately, is insecure at best. They're not asked to pretend otherwise. They're asked to look behind and beyond what they're experiencing now. Where is hope? Where is hope in such a world? Where is hope in our world? His name is Jesus. There is hope. Let's pray. Father, we, we would see, we would see beyond what we experience in our daily lives, beyond the stress, beyond the hard news that we live in and with. Father, we would see beyond this. Your word opens up to us a world of hope because of Jesus. Because you are on the throne. All glory and praise to you, Father, for you reign. You are the one who lives forever and ever, as does your Son. Father, fill us with hope that as we live our lives, as we absorb the news as we have to make decisions. May we do so filled with hope because of Jesus, who is our hope, because he has conquered, and he lives forever and ever. And he has the keys. He is breaking the seals. He is the one in whom we trust. And we ask this because of him and for his sake. Amen.